the invention of this idea that you referred to, that disparity means that there's discrimination going on, it is completely ahistorical and non-scientific in every way. Most people don't know what disparate impact was. If they did know what disparate impact was, they would probably be horrified by it. If you just had quotas, like it might even be better because you could at least give a test and just take the best people. But you can't. But the law is such that you can't do that because you have to have the facade of uh, equal treatment, and so you can't just have quotas. So you just what you what you do is you just get rid of the standards completely. Richard, so you wrote this book, The Origins of Woke. Uh, it's a subject that, as you know, and as our audience know, we've been talking about for a long time. Mm -hmm. You have a different take on it, actually, to quite a lot of people. Before we get into the origins of woke, the one thing that everyone uh, who hates to people talking about woke claims is that no one can define what woke is. You actually start by defining what woke is. What is woke? Yeah, I mean, yeah, this this is a sort of a strange thing to pretend like, you know, we can't define this thing. And sometimes people can't because people don't think about definitions well. But, I, you know, I think that you know, we all sort of have the idea. We know something is woke. We know Ibram Kendi is woke, and uh, you know the Southern Baptist Convention is, is is less so, right? I mean, we all sort of have this understanding. Um, and so, I think you know, I have a definition that I think covers most of it. Um, it's not too broad. It's not too narrow. It's the idea that disparities are caused by discrimination. They could be past or present. So, if blacks do less well on a test than whites, or you know, there's a difference in arrest rates between races, or men earn more money than women, that's due to discrimination, past or present. You know, it's, it has to be white versus non-white or men versus women. It, we don't care about other kinds of disparities. Um, you need speech restrictions um, in the interest of overcoming these disparities. So you have to get rid of, you know, stereotypes, people, you know, having un, you know problematic thoughts about uh, origins of disparities that are not discrimination. Uh, and then there's a bureaucracy that sort of, you know, tries to overcome disparities and also enforces the speech code. So this is everything from, uh, you know, the DEI offices and universities uh, to, you know, like nonprofits and government institutions that are trying to close various racial uh, and gender gaps. So the three ideas of disparities equals discrimination, speech codes, and the bureaucracy enforced to these ideas, I think is the core of wokeness and how we talk about it in modern society. Very interesting. And we, particularly with reference to the bureaucracy, this is why I mentioned you have a, an original way of looking at where this comes from. Tell us where you think workness comes from. Yeah, I mean, so, the, you know, the civil rights movement was sort of like this moral and legal and cultural tsunami that washed over the United States in the uh, mid-1960s. Um, and, you know, it, it did some things that everyone agrees, you know, most everyone agrees is good now, like eliminate uh, explicit discrimination, state sanctioned discrimination, uh, even in the private sector, uh, you know, told people they couldn't discriminate based on race and sex. What, you know, so people, that's sort of the standard history and that's, that part is true. Um, at the same time, it sort of empowered a bureaucratic class to look for discrimination, um, wherever they could find it. And the definition of sort of discrimination and what counts as discrimination, um, expanded and it was given the force of law. Uh, and so a lot of these things that you see as wokeness, what people would call wokeness in the last 10, 15 years, um, have been part of American law since the real, sometimes in some cases since the early 1970s. Uh, so the idea that if you take a test and whites do better than blacks, you know, it's always funny to me that people, you know, Twitter, they, they sort of treat it like it's a new idea that no one ever thought of before. No, it's been law in the United States since 1971, right? We've had two, three generations of this being the law of the land that if you give tests, you know, you better be careful. Or if police arrest one group or the other, yeah, we still have disparities and we still have tests and we still have police arresting people, right? But it's always sort of, there's always sort of a tension in the, all the rules that we have for like having a society, because literally everything you do that's meritocratic or that tries to keep order has a disparate impact uh, based on race, based on sex or whatever. And so like, it sort of goes through waves where some of the stuff, sometimes this stuff becomes more prominent, sometimes less, uh, but it's part of, it's just very, very deep in sort of the legal fabric of American society right now. And I think that the, a lot of the cultural sort of you know, the, these corporations like paying, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars um, for these, uh, you know, HR and DEI consultants. I think a lot of it is clearly downstream of the law, which I try to show, uh, you know, just try to show sort of step by step in the book, the history of how that happened. Uh, Richard, do you think, because there's always going to be people who say, you know, this is a conspiracy, this has been put together by whoever it may be. Do you think it is or do you think that they were, these were well-intentioned people, as it were? Uh, you know, it depends on sort of what level you're, 
you know, you're talking about. Um, you know, there's all, you know, the sort of civil rights movement always had a sort of communist component. Even them, you might say that they're well, you know, well-intentioned. They they just think communism is a good thing. Um, but you know, there was always sort of that. There's sort of sort of sort of that wing. Um, but then the people who actually made the decisions that really embedded wokeness in law, you can, you know, you can look them up and they were in many cases, sort of mainstream Democrats, center left, um, you know, judges, they were, you know, they didn't want to overthrow capitalism or get rid of the system. You know, they generally, they genuinely thought, I think every generation probably believed like, okay, we need, yeah, until recently, I think, I think like it's been going on so long, but I think, I think that like the earliest generations that sort of, you know, uh, got the ball rolling here. Um, did think that you know you would have affirmative action for a generation, or you would have make the police less racist for a generation, or twenty years, or whatever, and then you would move on. Um, it didn't work out like that, and you know, and, and even like Richard Nixon, who I cover in the morning, not a leftist, not a communist, not trying to you know uh, you know bring down the white race or anything like that. You know, he was he himself was sort of caught up in this in the early days of the civil rights in the uh, civil rights era. Um, it, you know, and then eventually, I think when sort of all that stuff was discredited by that time, it just became the status quo. Um, it became if you wanted to get rid of affirmative action, if you wanted to get rid of disparate impact, you were seen as this, you know, big racist. And why were you thinking about these things? And nobody did think much about these things for a while until recently, I think, when the, sort of the Great Awakening took off and this stuff became so in everyone's face that like there was no no choice but to talk about it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, my my worldview on this is more unintended consequences and uh, bureaucratic politics that it is some kind of, you know, conspiracy theory to to bring society down or something like that. Because it, to me, this seems very much like the law of unintended consequences, that you, you implement something and then 10 or 20 years down the line, it doesn't matter how talented you are as a legislator, how, uh, how smart you are, nobody can look into the future. And what you think that you're doing at this particular moment, I mean... What do you have to go on but an educated guess? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, one thing like Thomas Sowell points out in, in some of his books is that uh, racial preferences are pretty standard in diverse societies, you know, all over the world. Um, and so, like, you know, there's not, you don't have to explain it. There was something in American ideology or somebody did that. You know, I think that this is sort of in a democracy with uh, racial disparities. You sort of get this stuff um you know, naturally, and you know, it's the America maybe was a little bit more resistance to it because of its constitution and its founding. Um, but yeah, the, you know, a lot of you know, a lot of the, the the sort of the and the sort of direction I it took, which I cover in the book, like why do we care so much about you know female sports in, uh, in you know in colleges? Um, I don't do think we... we do anymore, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we've, yeah, we well we found a little bit of a twist where the right wing position has become yeah. you know protect women's sports. It's a funny thing where it's like yeah. you know it's just like people don't really know the history here; and they're just sort of you know flip flopping their uh, their positions. Uh, but yeah, you know, the, I think the you know the the American version of this is very very you know intimately related with our laws. Um, so, Richard, let, as somebody who doesn't know a great deal about American law, and certainly, you know, by state as well, can you give some examples to illustrate your case? What exactly, give some specific examples for exactly what is actually going on here? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, you know, there, first of all, there's the disparate impact doctrine. So in 1971, the Supreme Court ruled that under affirmative, uh, under, uh, I'm sorry, under the um, uh, Civil Rights Act, the discrimination did not just mean I have a job where I you know, don't want black people to be hired or, or something like that. Basically anything you did could, that had a disparate impact means that one group did better than the other. And it's, 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 I'm not exaggerating and saying it could be literally anything. It could be a policy that says, if you have a criminal record, uh, I'm not going to hire you. It could be a, a tardiness policy. All of this stuff has been sort of litigated or debated at some point. It becomes problematic from a legal perspective. You have to show a business necessity. So the it's not necessarily illegal, but the burden of proof becomes on you, the employer, uh, to show that like this is necessary and you could potentially be sued over it. So that's one. That's a disparate impact doctrine. That's pretty much the entire private sector. That's all government hiring. Um, you also have affirmative action in government contracting, where basically, you know, everything in American law they deny that there's quotas, and it's all done in the name of um, uh, it's all done in the name of equal opportunity. Um, but if you have a contract with the government, and a lot of corporate America does, uh, you have to basically give them numbers of the race and the sex uh, of the people in your workforce. And then if one group is underrepresented, you have to sort of submit plans uh, and how to uh, how to address that. Um, you also have sort of these like harassment laws where like, you know, if men want to, you know, if, <laughs> if, you know, you make a group uncomfortable based on their race or their sex, you know, before the 1960s, this was... Um, 
this was settled by you know the private sector. You didn't like the job, you wanted you got a new, you got a new job. Even in the first decades after the Civil Rights Act, people didn't interpret it as okay, like you have to you as an employer have to police the speech of your employees to make sure that the men you know don't be too aggressive hitting on the women or whatever. That was really an innovation in the 1980s. So a lot of the speech codes. Um, came out of that, came out of the idea that like you as an employer became sort of the babysitter for your population to protect some people based on their group identities. Um, and then there's all this stuff about, you know, colleges, colleges is their, you know, is their own category. A lot of these things that people think are organic to the university, they come from the federal government. So like when they used to have those title nine kangaroo courts, when men were accused of sexual assault, in a lot of cases, that was the Obama administration. You may know the history because this was covered well in the press that, you know, they would come in and they would say, okay, you know, you're, you're, you're violating the civil rights act. If you're not taking rape seriously enough, what is taking rape and sexual assault seriously enough mean? It means not giving any due process to the men and hiring all these feminist Title IX coordinators and letting them basically remake your university, right? Uh, so it's you know there's there's all these doctrines and all these sort of legal and, and you know the, the point is not just to sort of explain to people how this happened, which you know is interesting and important enough. Uh, part of the point is also to tell people like. Well, you know, here's how it happened, and there's actually something you could do about it because it's just it's just laws, it's just executive orders, judicial decisions, you know, legislation. The way this stuff was uh, implemented, it can also be undone the same way. Well, before we get to undoing it or, or changing the way that uh, the structure of it is, uh, how do you incorporate the impact of social media and the internet in the cultural dimension? Because what you're really talking about is the legislative and institutional implementation of wokeness. But I think we'd all agree that in the last decade or so since the emergence of social media, culturally, the ideas of wokeness have really taken off, mm -hmm. uh, fueled by social media, certainly in my opinion. Uh, how, do you, how do you think about that dimension of it? Yeah, so my friend Zach Goldberg has written about the Great Awakening, um, and he has all those charts showing that you know these terms like systemic racism and so forth go through the roof around 2011. I don't think it's a coincidence that it, uh, 2011 was around the time that Twitter became prominent. Um, and I don't think it's a coincidence that as soon as Elon Musk bought Twitter, you know, within uh, the first year of that happening, there were all these stories in the media about, oh, wow, conservative boycotts are suddenly working. You know, before that, conservative boycotts, if you did like a company doing some kind of trans initiative, you know, that was considered hate speech and your, you know, the algorithm either uh, repressed your speech or, you know, you were bad completely. Um, and so, yeah, there is room, you know, in the theory, you know, in this world for sort of technological forces and cultural uh, factors. And I, I do think that the internet and social media, you know, was important starting around 2010, 2011. Uh, at the same time, a lot of these ideas that sort of became more like prominent in the, you know, in the minds of the public, they were, you know, they, they were there before. It's just like liberals were sort of, they had more cognitive dissonance. They were a little bit more ashamed of them. There, were, there was, I think, a little bit more of a sort of uh, uh, compartmentalizing. Right. So like when Ibram Kendi comes along and says, uh, you know, we have we need a department of anti-racism, which says that anything that has a disparate impact on blacks relative to whites uh, needs to be, uh, you know, needs to be investigated or banned. Um, you know, that's been that's been something close to that has been in the has been the law for 50 years. It's just people started to notice it because Ibram Kendi sort of, you know, he came and he made it explicit and like people stopped being ashamed of it and they brought up and they gave speeches and they said, OK, let's just say this stuff out loud. Uh, but like every corporation and every government department has been operating on this basis, has been counting people according to race and sex and like, you know, doing soft quotas and making sure, you know, that, you know, policing the speech of employees. They've been doing that for decades and decades. Um, so. So, you know, there is there is uh, something new with social media. There is also a continuation um, that I think people don't realize has always been there. Well, <laughs> I, I, what what I mean, though, is I think it's like, I, I don't know, I'm probably a bit older than you. In When I was a young guy and I was kind of on the what you call liberal, I would mm. we in this country call left. I don't remember people pretending that you can change your sex by no, means that's of new. words. Yeah, and, unquestionably. You know. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, yeah, please. Yeah, I, the, the, yeah, I mean, I've read about this a little bit. Yeah, I, I think it, there's a, I, I say on race, you could look at like a conversation from 2020 in the US and a conversation from 1975, and they're almost the exact same thing. I mean, even like the police, the riots, like, some, you know, the 19, late 1960s, some, some, you know, 
gangbanger would, a career criminal would get killed by the cops. There'd be these riots. Some people would come out and say law and order. And some people would come out and say, no, no, we got to get at the root causes. We got to, you know, stop racism to prevent this. 1970, 2020, pretty much, you know, the exact same thing. On sex, there's a little bit of development. There's this, you know, idea that women, you know, should be just like the accommodated in work. Then it becomes, you know, women are a oppressed class. Uh, homosexuality and transgenderism here. I mean, I think that you're right. There have been, it has been revolutionary. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm also old enough to remember, um, when, you know, being gay was, you know, in high school was, we had one or two gay people and like, everyone would be like, ew, get away from me. This is the most disgusting thing in the world. Uh, right. Um, you know, 10 years later, you know, we start legalizing gay marriage. A few years later we have, uh, uh, you know, we have, um, uh, this new, um, uh, you know, gender identity idea. Um, and, uh, yeah, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. I don't think, I don't think civil rights law explains it, it, It's a little bit, I mean, there, Leo Sapir and, uh, a uh, guy at the Manhattan Institute has been doing some work about how some of the anti-bullying initiatives um, coming from the federal government might have made an impact here, um, but it's 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 not as easy to trace with race and sex. So I, I I do think you know I agree with you that if you know the the gender identity stuff is something something quite new. Yeah, I I wasn't trying to explore that uh, difference in in opinion just for the sake of it. It just seems to me that as we move on to talking about how to address some of this. Mm you're probably in a harder place to do it because you now have social media where a lot of even crazier ideas have become embedded in the public consciousness. So when you're talking about repealing certain legislation or uh, revoking executive orders or whatever, there's now a significant body of the public, or certainly the, the chattering public on social media who are just like, ah, you know, I can't yeah. believe you're even yeah. considering this. Yeah, but it's 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 a double edged sword because there's also um I you know I, I document the sort of the evolution of conservatives in the Republican Party over the time too, and there's also been a sort of conservative media ecosystem um, that has sort of uh, you know come around. And if you sort of if you look at the parties over the last thirty years, the trend is polarization on every almost every issue. The left becomes more left, and the right becomes more universally right wing. Um, so I think that like it's true, it's harder than ever to convince liberals of this stuff. It's easier than ever to convince conservatives of this stuff and get the message out there and show them how absurd it is. Um, so on that, I think it's actually good because you know you just have you just have to convince some people who are in power some of the time uh, in order to do this stuff. And it's also very damaging to the economy, Richard, because if you think if you run a construction company, most women don't want to work in construction. No. So I mean, what what are you going to do with That's that? Because construction <laughs> is sexist, mate. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. But but so so what can you do as a construction company? You know, the, the, how many women are you going to go start trawling the bars looking for women and asking if they want a job well, in construction? They do that with women's sports too. I mean, yeah, you're right. They do that with women's sports too, and like, uh, you know, like rowing. Like for example, because like, you know, not many women want to participate in sports as men, so they put up these rowing programs. Um, and rowing is a great sport because it requires tons and tons of people. So you just get as many women as possible. And you're like, okay, you're all rowers. And I remember when I was at UCLA, I, I knew this girl who would like, the, the, you know, they were just, they were filling bodies. Like a girl would join for two weeks. She'd recruit her friends. They joined for two weeks. Okay. I don't want to be a freaking rower. Or, you know, but that's not what little girls grow up, you know, dream of doing, but they'll just take anybody. They'll put them on the team. They've got to make the numbers work. I mean, you're right. There is, this is like a huge tax on like every part of society. And then it's just like, it's, you know, it's also a tax in the sense that like, you can't have standards. Like if you just had quotas, like it might even be better because you can, um, you could at least give a test and just take the best people, but you can't, but the law is such that you can't do that because you have to have the facade of, uh, equal treatment. Um, and so you can't just have quotas. So you just, what you do, what you do is you just get rid of the standards completely and then hope the numbers work out. It's really, it's really a sort of a, a twisted way to run a country. I mean, it's sort of amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. We <laughs> at all. But there's also hypocrisy there because nobody looks at the hundred meters final and goes, you know what? We need some more white guys here, you know? I mean, yeah. I'm sure there's some people who do, but they're a kind of a minority. I was looking at the New York City Marathon. Yeah, I tweeted about that a couple of days ago. I mean, it was like the top 20, like, or something like that, like 18 were from e East African descent. Um, and they were like East Africans from East Africa, and some of them were from America, and some of them were from uh, Western Europe. And they were all happened to be from Somalia or Kenya or Ethiopia and not even remarked upon. I mean, you look at the. Uh, you look at the New York Times with the reporting on the New York City Marathon. Yeah, just nothing. It, we ignore race in that situation. I guess it's just the best people won. And yeah. <laughs> and do you think we're we're ever going to get 
past the idea because Thomas Sowell, who I'm a huge fan of, mm. uh, you know, this is one of the things he's been talking about for decades now. The invention of this idea that you referred to, that disparity means that there's discrimination going on, it is completely ahistorical and non-scientific in every way. Yet, when I talk to people in in the United States in particular, because it's less embedded actually here in the UK, uh, I remember I was flying to Miami and I was sitting next to a guy who turned out to be a pilot for the airline that I was sitting in. He was a very smart guy. He was a black guy. And when we were talking about what was happening in Florida, he said, well, I'm an independent, but, you know, DeSantis is anti-work, so I don't like him. And we got into a big conversation about it. And mm. one of the things he was saying is this very simple idea. And I, again, I emphasize he was a smart guy, mm. right? But his, he, he was like, look, the statistics show that the number of black airline pilots does yeah. not correspond to the percentage of the black population of the United States. That means there's discrimination. And I'd like to think I'm a reasonably persuasive guy. I tried every which way. I approached it from a hundred different angles. The poor guy was stuck next to me for about three hours. I know how he feels, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't get it. I could not get past the idea with him. To him, it's just like disparity, discrimination. I could not find a way through. So it's just so embedded with many people now. Yeah, I mean, in the American context, it's very interesting because, yeah, I mean, it is. there is a lot of historical guilt about the situation of Black Americans. I don't think people... Like nobody thinks that Asians doing better than on whites uh, than whites on tests is discrimination or Asians being uh, arrested less. Even Hispanics and Latinos, you know, like you'll hear that, but it, it's not. It, it, you know, you don't see a lot of New York Times or Washington Post uh, stories about you know too few Hispanic pilots. I mean, sometimes you do, but it, it's usually piggybacking off of the black experience. So you're 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 right. It's 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 an American specific idea, but it's also an American black specific idea just because we have sort of all this racial baggage uh from our history that just sort of shuts off our braids whenever we think of the black issue and then that becomes transferred like when we think about hispanics when we think about women we have this template um that we sort of just are so, so sort of uh, uh emotionally salient right uh that it becomes sort of the way we think about everything well that's interesting because this guy was actually not african-american mm. as you like to say he was um from the Caribbean, and he'd moved to the U.S. as a yeah, as a teenager. which is interesting because the people in Caribbean from the Caribbean do relatively well in the United States. So you think if there was discrimination, right, they would see that that's the problem. But that's often the case. I mean, Eric Holder, you know, a very left wing uh, attorney general under Obama, also of Caribbean descent, right? So often they they come, the Caribbean, you know, Amer the blacks from the Caribbean succeed, and but then they assimilate into the ideology that says, you know, black people can't succeed in America. It's very Well, what was interesting as well is when I sort of did get him to see that there are contexts in which you can't just automatically assume discrimination because uh, someone is not as represented as they are in the general population, he then pivoted to, well, yes, but the company provides a better service mm -hmm. Yeah. If it's representative of the population, which I thought was an interesting argument, because I, I I don't know that there's any evidence for that. I mean, especially for pilots, like for teachers or police, you hear that sometimes, right? It sort of yeah. makes sense a little bit, but you know, do you know how do you do you pay attention to the race of your pilot? Do you feel safer when they're of your race? It's it's a, in that context, yeah, it's a very odd argument. So, given that historical um, guilt and. Uh, history that is awful in in the united states let's let's be clear about that right um how does that ever get healed is there a way to overcome that is there a way to heal that is there a way for you know people talk about reparations and it seems like a very crazy idea just because you'd struggle to implement it and blah 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 but is there a way that the united states is ever going to overcome the fact that you know it was a country that used slavery in in for a long time and then discriminated against people who were descendants of slaves yeah, I mean, in like, you know, sort of these, you know, in tribal society, sometimes you'll just have like blood money, right? Something bad will happen and one group will just pay off the other. Uh, the point of that and the benefit of that is that, that it, that's it. it. It wipes the slate clean, right? Um, so if there was some way to just, you know, have a, you know, cut a check, um, you know, we can't bankrupt ourselves, but, you know, something. You're already uh, but, bankrupt, so, yeah. yeah. We're already bankrupt, <laughs> right? You know, very, very theoretically. Well, I mean, you do see this reparations movement and, you know, 
you never see them say that. You never see them say, okay, we've calculated, you know, 50,000 per person or so. You know, usually it's much bigger than that. It's some ridiculous number, but it's never like, okay, no affirmative action, no disparate impact, no, no, none of them. We never talk about race. We can't complain about racism ever again. Um, if it was something like that, there could be some kind of basis for, a conversation, right? But it's all—it's always just more of the same. It's you do reparations, and then you have everything else remain the same, and continue to guilt people. Um, and so, yeah, if we did—if we did have to do some kind of healing, I would prefer a one-time payment rather than. 200 years from now, we're still talking about littering laws are racist because, you know, black people, you know, get, get uh, cited for them more than white people or, you know, airline, you know, the airlines are racist or whatever. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just very, very hard because I think that there's, you know, I, I think there's an understanding even among, they, they don't, they know it won't fix it. They know there are problems in the black community. You know, they know that one group has, you know, 70% out of wedlock births and another group has, you know, 30% out of wedlock births, you know, that there's going to be disparities that way. You could give people a check. That's not going to, that's not going to fix that. Right. And so I think they even understand that. So it's, it's just a matter of, you know, it's just a matter of sort of this permanent, this idea of sort of permanent revolution. Um, and you know, conservatives, I think, you know, some conservatives might be open to one-time reparations payment, but they see what's going on and they say, yeah, of course we're just, this is just another, another program and won't do anything damp and anything else. Yeah. I, I think that's a very good point because the reality is, is these arguments, a, a lot of the time, they're not based in fact, they're based in emotion. And when someone is emotional, it's very difficult to rationalize with them and go, well, look, well, what is it that you actually want? What is it that you want to achieve? What is it that you want from this particular discussion? Because or, or they want to feel better or they want to win or whatever it may be. And that's very, very difficult to deal with. Yeah, yeah, that that's right. I think, yeah, people just sort of, they need a, you know, sort of a... Um Look, there's a you have. I think you have to tell people a, a, a different story. You could tell people that story, which is true that black people were enslaved and mistreated for much of American history, and, and that's fine. Um, at the same time, you have to tell people that you know, which is just as true that America has been you know a you know a remarkable you know engine of sort of uh, human well being, bettering of all races, including black people in America. You know, there's a population of thirty uh, something like 35, 40 million black Americans who have a higher standard of living than black people in any part of any other part of the world. Um, and you know, like every other group comes here and does and does pretty well. And we should be thankful for that, right? And we should be thankful in the end that like as bad as it was in the past, we ended up in a pretty good place from a historical perspective. Um, and you know, I I don't know. I, I think there's just sort of there's such a tendency to compare to, you know, or to obsess about um, you know, past mistreatment or disparities between groups that it's hard to get there. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, just like sort of Fixing the civil rights laws, I think, as part of it can make this stuff less salient and at least give them less political power. But as far as sort of the emotional baggage we have um, here that sort of envelops everything in society, you know, that's a much harder question and sort of a larger project to deal with. Well, let's talk about fixing the civil rights laws. I mean, I, I, I wonder whether I agree with you that that would give them less salience. I, my sense, based on what we've observed in recent years of American politics purely as an outsider, is... Um, and this is kind of the point I was making earlier to you is every time conservatives or the right attempt to deal with some of these issues, everyone freaks out massively. And we saw this with Donald Trump, where essentially his ability to do many of the things that uh, he was trying to do was impeded by the fact that anytime he, you know, t took a breath, the media lost their shit. And then, you know, he was evil, blah, 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 blah. And then he ended up not doing uh, many of the things that he promised to do. But tell us about uh, fixing the civil rights laws, and then we'll, we can argue about that. Yeah. So within the book, I mean, I do have like a political analysis. I, I do just, I, I, you know, I, I say that this is what you do, but I think that it's, you know, quite doable. So, you know, when the okay. Supreme Court ruled on affirmative action, um, that got some attention, a, a lot of attention. It wasn't, there wasn't protests in this, you know, in the streets. It wasn't like when George Floyd got killed. Um, it wasn't even like Dobbs where it had this electoral backlash because, you know, part of the reason why, because most of the public agreed with it actually. Um, and a lot of public, well, on the abortion issue, the left knows that most of the public agrees with them. And so they keep harping on it and it's, you know, politically advantageous for them to do so. Um, and so that was just, you know, that was sort of more salient than most things. That was, you know, getting rid of affirmative action in universities. A lot of the stuff that I'm talking about is very beneath the surface, right? The disparate impacts. Does this, are you defined discrimination based on 
the number of people you you know the explicit discrimination or you know uh the te- you know the tests are disp- you know the disparities based on tests you know if people most people don't know what disparate impact was if they did know what disparate impact was they would probably be horrified by it i think it was uh stupid um and so i think a lot of the stuff is it's you know what liberals pay attention to and what you know sort of outrages people isn't always the most important thing Right. So you could do some things that are important and can, you know, make a big difference, but that people really won't notice the way that they notice a lot of uh, other things. Um, well, until so, yeah. the media blow it up, yeah, yeah. I mean, th- there's that, right? The media are going to say, but, they have, but, they, but like I said, I think they follow public opinion and even left wing opinion. Like, so, like abortion, they will, you know, keep harping on because they think it can help Democrats and they can win elections. They want to, they want to run out of affirmative action and make that the biggest deal. You know, they've tried to brainwash people all that stuff. It doesn't work. You know, people always think it's messaging. It's like no, like the public. You know, they're not, they're not, uh, they don't take the pro life position and they're not going to be for affirmative action and like, you know, re, uh, you know, the equity agenda. You just can't get them to do that. Not even California, not even Washington, when they vote <laughs> for it. So they can, they can freak out, but they're probably going to limit themselves just because they, you know, they're being strategic here or sort of like, you know, sort of subconsciously strategic about what helps liberals. Um, and at the same time, they're just, there's just not an audience for a lot of this, you know, sort of wokeness as law. Um, and so I do think this stuff is doable. Um, you know, and so, you know, a lot of it can be done through the executive branch. A lot of it can be done through the courts, the affirmative action that I talked about in government contracting. That was an executive order, um, that could be undone by executive order. Uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, I told him about this executive order and he promised that on the first day of his office, not just to me, I mean, publicly, uh, that he would, (laughs) he would repeal that. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't going to get that much attention because nobody even knows about affirmative action in government contracting, right? There's so many things that they could be getting outraged about. Um, and so there's that, you know, there's the disparate impact doctrine and I mean, it has to go, um, you could do that, that, that was not in the original civil rights act. I mean, it could be done through courts or could th- through the, uh, executive branch. And then a lot of this stuff is sort of the power of the purse stuff. You know, you see, um, this isn't sort of realistic at the federal level right now with, a uh, with Biden in office, but at the state level, you do see states getting rid of DEI offices. Um, you know, it's, it's been happening in Iowa. I've seen it happen in Texas and happening in Florida. Uh, and so a lot of the civil rights stuff on the universities, uh, came through the power of the purse saying, look, we give all this government money to you. You do what I want. Um, you could do it in reverse too. And we've seen some states start to do that, start to do that. Uh, Richard, sorry, Francis, go, go, just go. to finish on this point. A um, uh, quick question I have is, particularly at the federal level, the stuff you're talking about, I mean, you're a smart guy, but you're probably not the only guy that's realized this is going on. How come Republican presidents in the past haven't tackled these issues in the way that you're advocating? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people, you know, like if you go to sort of yeah, I, 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 and this is such an important question and such a good question that I don't, that I, uh, that I have an entire chapter, uh, in the book about like, where have Republicans been? And I frame it in exactly that way. The public is sort of with you on this. It's important. It's a big deal. And so, you know, where, where have you been? Um, people don't, I think people, what people don't realize is that there really wasn't a conservative media. Um, until the late 1990s, right? Um, if you look at the cover, like in 1980s, Ronald Reagan actually fought on this stuff. He tried to get rid of uh, affirmative action to government contracting. He tried to do some stuff that I describe in the book on civil rights law to sort of uh, take the foot of the federal government off of um, off of the uh, uh, off. He actually vetoed a bill uh, to basically protect, you know, uh, religious liberty and basically be able to get, get rid of a lot of this title nine feminist regulations away from universities. It got overridden. And you look at the media coverage at the time, the media coverage, the only stories you could find are the Washington post, New York times about how this is just Republicans are racist and Democrats are, are not racist. And so there's no conservative media. It's, it's completely, there's a monopoly of information in the late 1990s. You get Fox news. Um, and then you have two thousands, the war on terror sort of dominates everything. This stuff has now been around for 20, 30 years. So we've only had like 25 years of like conservatives sort of having like there's conservative legal scholars who've done a good, a lot of good work that I've cited them. Right. But they're not the people who are getting, you know, the attention of the senators and the, and the president. Right. Um, and so we've only had really like 25 years of any kind of real, uh, conservative media to, to any substantial degree. Um, and you know, a lot has been going on in that 25 years. Um, and this stuff was in many cases decades old. Uh, so they're, you know, they're really, you know, you sort of have to, you know, people, people forget. I mean, a lot of this stuff was sort of live issues in the 1970s, 1980s. It went around for a very long time. Um, and so I think now is the time to act on it. I, I just think that people sort of, uh, you know, people, people sort of, you know, underestimate how much like knowledge and you know, knowledge can be just sort of lost if people don't pay attention to something. It just becomes part of the status quo. 
Richard, would you not say that it would need to be a very, very brave president to do this? Because if you think how charged literally every discussion is now, now people can almost come to blows with a discussion about should men be allowed to walk into a woman's toilet? And we're talking here about dismantling civil rights laws. I mean, that is going... that could very well be a powder yeah. keg of an well, issue. You, you don't, I mean, you don't call it dismantling civil rights laws. You say, r r and this is actually true, you say... <laughs> you know, you, 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 He's a political say, expert, yeah, mate. Yeah, mate. That's what I do. We're going to come out and dismantle civil rights laws and put it to the head. <laughs> yeah. No, you say go to the back to... Which is actually true. You say you go back to the original intent of the Civil Rights Act. You're strengthening right. civil rights law, right? Like the people who sued to get rid of affirmative action, they didn't call themselves, you know, the Anti-Civil Rights Coalition. They called themselves, you know, Students for Fair admission, Admissions, yeah. right? Um, so, yeah, I, I don't, you know, like, yeah, brave president. I don't know. Like, like, I mean, we have, I mean, Trump was a brave president. I mean, he did a lot of things that angered a lot of people a lot of the time. This stuff is a lot, you know, less unpopular than a lot of the other stuff he did. Um, so it's doable. I mean, he signed that executive order. I mean, the more, sort of the closest analog to this is he signed that executive order in the last months of office uh, after he saw Chris Rufo on Fox News that said um, no more critical race theory training in the federal government. Got a little bit of attention. It wasn't the biggest scandal of his presidency. But, you know, president, you know, Republican presidents are polarizing anyway. They do stuff that angers the media. It's it's not you know impossible to imagine. Richard, do you think it, it might be that we've reached what is a lot of people term peak woke, and as a result of reaching peak woke, this is a much easier policy to implement, or do you think we haven't reached that point yet? We haven't reached the height of the insanity. Yeah, I mean, I, I did I, you know I did write an article on this. I think that sort of I, I do think we you know it depends on where you're looking. So if you're looking at universities or the media, um, I think woke has been sort of institutionalized, and it's it, it's it's not like it was in 2020, but it is. I mean, it is sort of just you know it's in the it's in the ether now. It's fundamental to like what institutions are. Um, as far as the wider culture. I do think we're past peak woke. I mean, mostly because things can't go on forever. Like you can't maintain the frenzy of summer 2020, you know, indefinitely, like you have to go back to some kind of normalcy. Um, but like, you know, Ethan Strauss, um, who's got a good sub stack as a sports writer, um, has written about how basically the sports coverage just went back to covering sports. Like two, three years ago, it was, you go to the front page and half of it is, you know, some kind of woke nonsense. They're still liberal, but they're mostly just covering sports now. Um, and I think that's sort of a good bellwether to where we are, to where we are. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that, yeah, we are in a place where, um, you know, I, I think that people sort of, you know, there's been, you know, people, media figures, you know, people in, in law and government. I mean, they've 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 pushed back on it. Um, I think the ports of civil rights law is like sort of like it's always it, it's sort of like having a state religion. It, it stays latent, right? So, like, in, I want to make sure in 15, 20 years we don't have another summer of 2020. Civil rights law makes it very, very easy to do that because it's all there's always lawsuits, there's always bureaucracies around. You know, if they go away, you won't notice that they go away, but they just go away, and then we don't have a summer of 2020 again. We don't have you know all these crazy sort of initiatives. Uh, so yeah, I do think overall we are probably past peak woke, and yeah, it's also a good. It's a good. I mean, it's a, it's, it's, it's something it might make it harder because there's no uh, there's no. Um, uh, urgency. It's just like, oh, the problem solved itself. But like, no, institutions are still doing racial bean counting. They're still relying on disparate impact. They're still doing affirmative action. So you got to keep reminding people that it's actually, you know, it's important to, to, you know, to, to focus on these issues and to do something about them. The thing that I always found very interesting is the role of shareholders in this. So for instance, you know, all these shareholders with, you know, in, who've bought shares in huge companies, and then the performance of a said company, let's take Disney, for example, because it has these... Just a random. Yeah, just a random, just a random company. Because yeah. it embraces these policies and these ideologies, suddenly the profits go through the floor. I would always thought that there'd be a real tension there with the shareholder, because surely they're furious. Well, I mean, maybe, but remember, before Elon Musk bought Twitter, you had, you had civil rights law, you had sort of this bullying from the government, and you also had the media, which would, you know, you can you stand up to Black Lives Matter, they'll portray you as the Ku Klux Klan, and is that good for shareholder value? No, I think in a lot of cases, they were following their interests by just giving in. You know, the mob comes and says, nice story you have there, you know, it'd be a terrible shame if something happens to it. It's often rational to just 
give in, even though you would rather, you know, you would rather ideally not have to pay any kind of protection money. Um, and so I do, you know, I, I do think this is, cons- I do think what we've seen is sort of consistent now with like, you know, now with like uh, social media changed and some of the conservatives being, you know, pushing back uh, through the states, through the state governments, um, uh, you know, in other, in other means, I, you know, I do think that there has been sort of a shift in corporate America. So yeah, I, I do think it, all of this is consistent with sort of a, a classic capitalist model where, you know, businesses do what's in their financial interest. The, the job of sort of activists and people in politics is to make their interest to, to do the right thing. Yeah, and we saw that. I mean, with Bud Light, they went from uh, Dylan Mulvaney to now advertising with the UFC. That's <laughs> that's yeah. that's a shift, isn't it? <laughs> hey, Francis, do you want to protect your privacy? Of course I do. Now that I'm an international celebrity who's appeared on hit shows like the Joe Rogan Experience, I have to protect myself from vicious people looking to tear me down. I'm the Michael Jackson of the internet. Not the celebrity I would have gone for, but trust is important when picking a VPN. I don't trust anyone after she left me. She took everything. Francis, remember what your lawyer said. Good point. You can trust ExpressVPN because they don't sell your data to advertisers. They've even created software called Trusted Server that means they can't store any data at all. ExpressVPN uses Lightweight, a VPN protocol that makes user speeds faster than ever. ExpressVPN is now blazingly fast. You can watch HD videos with zero buffering. Thousands of pounds in legal fees. The great thing about ExpressVPN is that you don't need any technical skills to set up, just like Francis. Fire up the app and it's one button to connect. One tap on a button was all it needed for my entire life to disintegrate. Loads of people are saying that ExpressVPN is the best VPN there is. Business Insider, The Verge, and many other tech journals rate ExpressVPN as the number one VPN in the world. Go on, Francis. Protect yourself with ExpressVPN. Use our link, expressvpn.com slash trigger today and get an extra three months free on a one-year package. That's expressvpn.com slash trigger Visit expressvpn.com slash trigger to learn more. She took everything. But listen, uh, it, it's a great book. I really recommend people check it out. There's one other thing uh, I wanted to talk to you about before we, we head over to locals and ask you questions from our audience. Um, people, when you wrote the book and when you were gearing up to promote it, uh, some some people in the media uh, came after you and sort of did a, an expose on your past mm-hmm. and uh, you were quite you had some extreme views in the past that you've written about um, since and that I thought it was a very interesting thing where someone a someone in the public eye who did have extreme views that were revealed they came for you and they didn't manage to cancel you but the other yeah. thing that I, I thought was interesting as well was that you were someone who just owned the, the mistakes that they'd made and kind of described how you went from where you were to where you are now. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I think that would be fascinating for people. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. You know, it dropped, it dropped about a month and a half uh, before my uh, book came out. And this stuff was, you know, stuff that I'd written 15 years ago. I mean, it's not, it, it, I don't stand by it. I think it's, you know, I think it's awful stuff. And I think people sort of, and I was lucky, I think, because I had um, a body of work since then. Where people can see that, like, that's not how I think anymore. At the Richard, same time, Richard, sorry to interrupt. Not- Just give us a flavor of some of the things that you were writing about back then, and sort of some of the views you held. Yeah, I mean, so I, you know, I believed, I believed in basically a white identity politics. Um, I thought that the, you know, even though I'm Middle Eastern, I thought that this was sort of maybe necessary to counteract um, leftist identity politics. There was a sort of uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, like immigration restrictionism uh, on that basis. Stuff about you know, women shouldn't vote and this and that, and you know, which I, you know, I've denounced explicitly even before this stuff came out. So you know, basically, like imagine a, a right wing, um, you know, anonymous poster, but you know, uh, you know, a little bit more. <laughs> sort Not of, hard to I, imagine. No. We see a lot of those. Yeah. But yeah. what I'm curious about, and I know you've written about in your Substack, is how you came to have those ideas in the first place. Because frankly, let's be honest, there's quite a lot of people that are leaning in that direction, certainly online, as you say, anonymously, etc. So please understand, I'm not trying to make you look bad here. I'm just very yeah. curious to explore no, no, I appreciate how you yeah. come to that and then how you move out of that. That's very yeah. interesting to me. Yeah, yeah. 
and and I did write an essay, you know, explaining that. So yeah, it's, it's of course, uh, you know, I appreciate you asking. Um, it's uh, yeah, I mean, I think you start out with. I think this is where where this is sort of my journey. I think it's a lot of people's journey too. Is that you see the mainstream media and you know institutions, education are absolutely insane on some issues, right? America is a white supremacist nation. There are no differences between men and women. I didn't have to, you know, I, I sometimes see people who read scientific papers, like, look, men are stronger than women. I'm like, you have to read scientific papers. For this. <laughs> just like the moment I heard it, I was just like, you know, you watch the nature shows and they show the male behaves like this and the female behaves like this. And it's like, where, where does this stuff come from? And, you know, when I was in college, I would have like these cultural anthropology courses. And I remember just questioning like the professor on this, you know, this assumption of like, gender blank slightism and he just had nothing i mean it was just really really bad and so you start out with that like okay people are lying to you in an extreme absurd way you know it's not like they're just the facts are a little bit off it's like they're telling you the sky is green um and then it becomes easy to think all society is corrupt you know everything is false right i think people like you know they get into like revisionism about like world war ii or like they get into like anti-vax or you know anything people will conspiracy theories people will buy into anything because of the because of just how crazy sort of society is on race and gender and now with gender identity i mean it's even it's even it's even crazier um and i think it's just sort of some part of it is just sort of like a, a logical thing where like people have been lying to me so i'm just gonna think you know whatever anonymous person says on the internet hap- you know it's true part of it is just emotional you become alienated from society you become angry you see sort of a lot of dysfunction and you see people are lying to you about it um and you sort of just take this you know uh, antagonistic view towards society um and then you uh yeah you, you it could drive some people crazy um and I think what's you know so something a little bit different for me is that I didn't become like a leftist. I still think liberals are absolutely crazy on race, on gender issues. Um, but you know, I grew older and smarter and thought more carefully about it and wanted to give people constructive solutions to do something about it. Um, and you know, also my worldview sort of became less conspiratorial over time as I did see you know sort of the history of civil rights law, just more knowledge of where this stuff came from, out of a genuine interest in it. Um, and, you know, and then also observing that a lot of times the non-mainstream people, you know, the anonymous Twitter accounts or whatever, they're also crazy. They also believe things that are obviously not true. In many cases, they're, you know, worse than the mainstream media. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's just having that balance, just knowing that they're lying to you, knowing what they're saying is false, but not going into sort of this habit of, you know, always talking about them lying to you. <laughs> that's like the default state of interacting with the world. And, you know, that's sort of my process. And I hope that other people uh, who sort of know the left is crazy on some issues, you know, I hope they could sort of, uh, I hope they could take some lessons from that. I think the dangerous thing about extreme ideologies, whether right and left, is that it co-ops people, but also it antagonizes others. And in many ways, it's actually the people who it antagonizes are even more dangerous. Like people go to me, you're worried about woke people, and I go, well, you know, I mean, they're here to they're here to stay, and what they I don't agree with a lot of what they've done, but I'm actually far more worried about the backlash that I see coming on the horizon than I am about woke people, if I'm honest. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's uh, yeah, I mean, the backlash is interesting. I mean, I do think that, like, you do see people who are on the right who are like just they do become like anti-democracy like it's it's sort of a trope yeah. that like you know liberals just made this like no like a lot of them do like putin a lot of them sort of have a grudging respect for the chinese right um a yeah. lot of them do just think democracy is false so you're absolutely right you know there is a there is a backlash that it can in many cases be just as bad as what it's fighting against yeah, I sat next to a guy at dinner a while ago who's like a prominent writer here in the UK. He was telling me how China is more democratic than the US. Yeah, and yeah. I was going, mate, <laughs> just like whatever you're reading, stop reading it because uh, your brain is, is, is melting here. Exactly. Perfect demonstration of the point. Yeah, you're absolutely right. But but it's also as well that, you know, they people become more emboldened the bigger the backlash grows. Yeah. And, and, and the thing that I find worrying as well is that uh, you know, by deplatforming these people, what you're effectively doing is you're giving these ideas a kind of glamour. You can't listen to it because, you know, this is this is so dangerous. And if you think about young people like yourself at the time, that's kind of, that could be interpreted as dissident thought. Yeah, 
Yeah. And a lot of them have embraced sort of the dissident thing, right? The dissident sort of, you know, they call themselves dissident writer or whatever. Uh, you know, the problem with that is, I mean, to call yourself a, just a dissident and say that's your sort of identity is like just as illogical saying I'm a mainstream media kind of guy. Right. <laughs> so whatever they right. say, I'm yeah. going to believe, right? You'll be, you'll end up just as stupid in many ways worse because like, you know, there's no accountability for like what anonymous people say online or in the media, like, you know, there's debate and there's people go back and forth. I mean, yeah, you could find a dissident view that China and Russia are more democratic and, you know, freer and better countries, and, you know, than the United, than the United States. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I think it's just a cautionary tale of like, you know, if you become, you know, anti-wokeness becomes, you know, goes too far, becomes part of your identity. Yeah. People, we, we, we've got to lead people away from that. That's not yeah, a good place to be. Yeah, yeah. I agree with you, man. And obviously the Francis and I, have, you know, people would say we're anti-woke because we are anti-woke. We've never made that our identity particularly, mm, yeah. but it does. But we fit- are dissidents. <laughs> but I, I, this isn't what dissidents look like, mate. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, the, the thought that what I started to notice with, I mean, Ukraine was a big one for me, but there was lots of others where it's like, like, oh, you are not someone who's just concerned about the fact that the mainstream has gone batshit, which it has. You're, you've got a form of like oppositional defiance disorder mm-hmm. where it's like whatever they say, you pick the opposite. And that's the entire posture towards the world that you have. What I uh, wonder, in, not to get too personal with you, but I'm just curious, quite often, I think, uh, moving from that sort of extreme way of looking at the world, did you start to change how you see the world because you maybe became a bit happier in your life? Did you, was that part of it or am I projecting here? No, I, I think that is, I mean, I think that is right. I was sort of, uh, yeah, I, I was much less happy 15 years ago than I am uh, now. And a lot of it was just sort of, you know, regular self-improvement, you know, getting in shape, you know, talking to girls, uh, you know, the stuff that people, uh, you know, the stuff that, you know, you're, you're, uncle might you know tell you might tell you to do yeah i think that you can't really separate this stuff i think that a lot of the wokeness um you've probably seen the uh uh data on wokeness and mental illness i mean it's undeniably you know there's a connection there and just from being around sort of uh you know sort of the right wing sort of dissident extremist sphere uh you see there's something similar going on you, you know that's that to me is absolutely clear from my experiences the, the thing that I find frustrating with, with, shall we just call them this dissident community, is they constantly attack woke people and they say, oh, they're losers, you know, they have a victim mindset. I'm like, mate, yeah. you've got a victim mindset. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's often, it's often, uh, it's often, you know, it, it's often just as bad or or worse, right? Like you'll see, yeah. you know, you'll, you'll see, you know, they'll say, oh, you, you know, like a lot of, you know, it, it's like, you know, people still get married. People still have kids. People yeah. still buy houses. I mean, life is continuing, right? It's not, there's not this apocalyptic dystopia that people on the online right imagine. Yeah, we have problems, but you know, you do you think about them, you put them in perspective, and you think of like you know uh, smart policy solutions to to deal with them. That's that's the healthy grown up way to think about these things. Richard, and one quick topic before we move to locals, because you mentioned being from the Middle East. Where where in the Middle East are you from? Uh, my dad is a uh, Palestinian Christian, and my mom is uh, a Jordanian Catholic. I throw the religion in there because people, you know, of course, want to know for uh, yeah. background yeah. purposes. I can't see you guys, by the way. You guys are frozen. Yeah, I can still we, hear we've you kind of, yeah, yeah. We've, you're frozen we're for us frozen. as well, well, Elliot. Now I oh, see. Yeah, you. There we go. Oh, yeah, yeah, there you okay, go. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Cool. So, uh, one quick topic before we move to locals and do questions from our audience with your Middle Eastern background. Um, How would you solve it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> You've been going hard at it on Twitter, which I'm enjoying. You you love trolling people, uh, and I love watching. I love trolling people. I love watching other people trolling people. It's a, it's a pastime of mine. Um, but you are. I have not seen anybody go harder on the Palestinians than you. Let's put it that way. So, what is kind of your take on the Middle East and and the conflict there and the events of the last six weeks? Yeah, so I have an essay on my Substack that's going to be. I've written a few essays, but I have another one where it's just going to be talking about uh, how we understand anti-Semitism, so we and our anti-Israeli sentiment. So a lot of people they think, you know, um, look, I, 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 I'll, you know, I'll put it this way: I've been reading a lot of and listening to a lot of sort of liberals talk about the current Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and you know, it's amazing. They don't deny they don't deny what Hamas is. They can't deny it. They don't even like. They don't even have a suggestion of who you would talk to on the Palestinian side to ever get peace. It's just like 
don't fight, you know, don't fight the war. Hope, you know, give them aid. Like, don't, don't like go to, don't go to war after this, you know, terrorist attack that killed 200 people, you know, like a medieval raid, like took off women and children uh, back to Gaza. And, you know, it, it, there's not even like a hint of a suggestion. And so, you know, it's there's there's good there has to be an Israeli response. I mean, Israel is threatened long term. They're having rockets thrown at the, you know lobbed at them from the north and from the uh, from the south. Um, you know, there's no you know there's technology that develops over time where the rocket technology and the drone technology potentially gets better. There's a terrorist organization. You know, it's basically a state. Um, Gaza, I mean, it runs its own affairs. Um, that is dedicated to Israel's destruction, doesn't even pretend to want like a two state solution or anything. And so like, you know, this is the, the, you know, the, the, the framework here is not like, you know, a criminal organization or like a terrorist organization on the other side. The framework here should be, you know, the threat from Germany or Japan and world war. And to that, like to the U S or Britain, like, I don't think Germany or Japan was as threatening as, as, uh, Israel or as the, uh, as Gaza is to the Israelis because they're right next to them. There's population there's, you know, uh, there's, uh, you know, uh, there's sort of a, uh, uh, you know, there's already, you know, rockets, there's a, a different level of technology. Um, and so, you know, I, and there's, you know, a commitment to their destruction in the way like Japan didn't want to, you know, necessarily destroy the US that wasn't like they're, you know, a part of their, you know, governing ideology. Um, and so Israel has to, you know, fight, I think Israel has to fight this war to win. Um, in the long run, it'll be better for the Palestinian people if they're not, you know, ruled by these terrorists. I, you know, I think that, the idea of open uh, pressuring the world to open up refugees, open up to refugees, and you know it could be the Arab states, it could be European states, it could be you know whoever. I mean, anywhere they would anywhere would be better than Gaza, right under Hamas, um, and being you know constantly uh, you know people call it an open air prison camp. So I think that I think that there should be sort of I think Israel has to just do what it needs to do to ensure its own security, and I think that there is no optimistic scenario of like what Gaza looks like with the Palestinians living there and. And you know, when when we have these tragic situations, we all we often, or in almost every other case, we accept the idea that people should become refugees and go start somewhere else because it's too you know it, it, it's too the situation is too tragic and it's too terrible where they are right now. It's better for them in the long run. Uh, so I think that should be sort of the goal here. Um, it doesn't seem like uh, you know it doesn't seem like a lot of the people in the region agree because you know they want to they they care about the Palestinian cause and a lot of people don't want the refugees. Um, but I think that's the that, that's the sort of that's the path to a long term humane solution to all of this. And what do you make of the argument? I mean, I heard John uh, Meyersheimer recently saying that the reason Hamas uh, attacked on October seventh is that. Uh, their, their resistance force fighting against Israeli occupation, fighting against Israeli oppression. And uh, as long as Israel uh, continues to have this right-wing government that is being uh, controlled by far-right forces within Israel that believe in a single-state solution where Israel controls everything, they believe in greater Israel, that's why Hamas lashed out and they'll continue to lash out as long as the Palestinian people are oppressed. Well, I mean, it depends on how you def- I mean, I mean, it's true in a sense, and that like it's because there's a dispute between the Palestinians and the Israelis and they're oppressed. But what does oppressed mean? I think that to to the to the a lot of the Palestinian people and to Hamas and Gaza, oppression means what happened in 1948, what's happened in 1967, right? And so yes, they're oppressed. They see the existence of the Jewish state itself as a source of oppression. So it's true if you gave up on the idea of Jewish of a Jewish state. Now, like this idea that like, Mer- you know, you could probably, you could have peace, of course. Now, this idea that, um, you know, I haven't heard, I haven't heard Mersheimer's opinion on this, but, uh, you know, taking your word as that's, that's what he, you know, that's what he's saying, or we can, we can uh, use that as an argument. Um, the idea that there's a difference between like a right-wing Israeli government versus a left-wing Israeli government, and that's going to make Hamas moderate and less likely to attack you know, Hamas itself doesn't say that. I mean, Hamas, you know, the, it's, it's a very big projection onto them. It's not like, oh man, Netanyahu won the election. If, you know, it, if it had been, you know, the, the labor party, if it, you know, the, the leftists had won, we'd be, you know, we'd be, we'd, we'd get to a two-state solution. There's not even like a hint of like pretending to think like this, right? Um, so I don't know like what evidence it would take to get people to just see that like, look, Hamas and, you know, the Palestinian people in general, you know, the, the majority of them um, don't want Israel to exist. Um, and their, you know, political and military actions are consistent with, with that belief and their words, I mean, and, and how they act. I, I just don't see what the evidence is for the opposite perspective. It's, it's a sensible perspective. I mean, like, 
you know, um, you could in some, you know, in some, uh, you know, the U.S. left Vietnam and, you know, the, the Vietnamese, you know, left the Americans alone. And, you know, they were was an ideology of destroying America um, from the Viet Cong. But uh, in this case, I just don't see what the evidence is for it. I mean, it's a great point. And also as well, I just it's that classic thing where people just want a simple solution to a very, very complex problem. They, yeah, they don't want trade-offs. They want to yeah. think like you must, if you're, you know, it's like, you know, it's like if the if the Palestinians are angry, it must be you have to be sort of nicer to them or be more humane, and then they're going to be less angry and you're going to achieve your security. It would be nice. If, you, know, you see these ideas like, oh, don't attack the people of Gaza. Don't kill a lot of civilians. Just go like kill the leaders of Hamas. It's like, you think like people weren't th- like the, nobody's tried that. You think Israel did a thing? Okay, oh, just kill the leader. No, they're they're in hospitals. They're they're you know they put uh, they put guns under the beds of their you know uh, of their children. Right? They live in these uh, they in these areas because that's their hope. That's their strategy for fighting. Right? So they're not making it easy for you. They're not going off to a field somewhere and saying, "Come fight us," and you can you know now drone us or meet us in the field. <laughs> they're doing. They're specifically you know playing to this human rights sentiment um, in order as part of their strategy because that's what they have. They're not. The, they're not the stronger side. Um, so yeah, I, I just think that, you know, just looking at sort of the left or the you know, so-called pro peace side um, in all this, it just strikes me as completely unrealistic. And Richard, thank you so much uh, for coming on the show. The final question is always the same. What's the one thing we're not talking about as a society that we really should be? Yeah. So in, uh, in you know, in the United States, we have a sort of a, a, a budget, um, uh, you know, an apocalypse upon us in 10, 15 years. Um, the population is getting older. The, if you look at the percentage of federal budget going to old people through Social Security and Medicare, it's very high. And these people are aging. And about 2033, the money runs out. We're either going to have to cut spending to old people and even like rich old people get the same benefits that you know poor old, poor old people do or we're going to have to sort of raise taxes uh and become a uh a euro welfare state but without even the welfare it's just all going to go to old people right um and so there's a guy named brian Rydell who i have my own podcast at C- uh, cspi center.com um i just talked to him about this the other week um and yeah this is the next 10 15 years i think this is going to really determine uh, you know, the future of sort of the American standard standard of living. So I, I encourage people to read up and think about the entitlements question because it's it's coming for us in the next 10, 15 years. All right. Well, we need a cull of old people. There we go, Richard. Uh, th- <laughs> uh, See, you are woke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah. Richard, Should great book, Origins of, of Work. I recommend everybody check it out uh, to get your take on it. We're going to head on over to Locals where we're going to ask you questions from our supporters that they've submitted. Uh, so we'll see you there. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. In recent years, the woke mob and anti-racist authors have attempted to say that only white people can be racist. How can a white person legally complain against something that, with modern language rebranding, no longer exists when applied to them? 